what do we do with revival? What, when we finally get what we've been asking for, what do we do with it? And, and as it always is the case, sometimes I think everybody gets up here and starts reading my notes or something. Because I'm, no, I know better than that. I know it's the Holy Spirit. Uh, just almost, I thought, well, I might as well just go home. Not they're going to mess around and preach my sermon before the night's over. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. That's what we're talking about, about preparing. Once we have revival, that is a preparation that goes on within us to preserve us, to keep us going until the Lord comes back. Turning your Bibles tonight to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. John the Baptist. Christ had some great things to say about John the Baptist. Luke chapter 3, and let's just start out tonight by reading the word. Heavenly Father, we just thank you as always, Lord. I ask that you just anoint this word tonight, Lord God. Help us, Lord, to receive what you've given us today, Lord God, that we might not consume it upon ourselves, Lord God, but that we might go forward into the kingdom of God to accomplish the mission set before Crossway Church, Lord. Help this church to be everything that you'd have us to be, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray with an anointing upon the word tonight, Lord God, that the Spirit of God would speak what needs to be spoke and that the ear would hear by the same power, the same Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Luke chapter 3, verse 4. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be brought low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough shall be made smooth and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, therefore, fruits worthy of repentance, and begin to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid under the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, which bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Praise God. And the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? Revival. Now what? Revival. Now what? Jesus said, And he answered and saith unto them, He that hath two coats, let him impart to him that hath none. And he that hath meat, let him do likewise. Then came also publicans to be baptized and said unto him, Master, what shall we do? And he said unto them, Exact no more than that which is appointed you. And the, and the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, What shall we do? And he said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse you any falsely, and be content with your wages. And as the people were in expectation, and all men mused in their hearts of John whether he was the Christ or not, John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one minor than I come that latches of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Revival prepares the heart. The preaching of God's Word. God chose the foolishness of preaching to expound upon this gospel, to take this gospel to the world. What the gospel does is it prepares the heart. Those who came and give their heart to Jesus Christ. I'm a little bit loud, Brother Nick. Getting a little bit of an echo down here. Those who gave their heart to Jesus Christ this weekend had their hearts prepared prior to coming to Christ. When you gave your heart to God, when that day when you accepted Christ as your Savior, there was a preparation going on in your heart. There was a cultivating of your heart that had been taking place. 
You didn't just suddenly decide one day, well, I think, you know, I need to go and get saved and, and start living for the Lord. It doesn't happen that way. It happens quicker with some people than others. But there's a preparation process that goes on that prepares the heart for salvation, that prepares that heart to bring it to a place. The Bible says that we can't come to God until he calls us. And so that calling is the Holy Spirit dealing with our heart. It may begin in tragedy. It may begin uh, 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 in the quiet times of, uh, of your nighttime. It may begin in uh, uh, even in the, it can even happen in the up times. And when things are going good, God can begin to deal with your heart. But there has to be a preparation. There has to be some cultivating going on in that heart in order for that heart to come to that place because we know that the heart is the seed of all evil that is within us. You're right, brother. It's not about self-esteem. We got too much self going on as it is. And it's not about uh, uh, thinking more highly of ourselves. It's about us getting ourselves to a point where we surrender who we are, what we're all about, and what is, you know, one of the things that kept me in the world for so long was I was afraid of what I would have to give up. And that sounds, that sounds so... Blase sounds, I don't know the right word I'm looking for here. It sounds so silly. I mean, we're talking about our souls here, and we're worried about giving up a can of beer or, or, or weekends at the lake or, or, or whatever it might be that, that keeps people attracted to the world. You know, the devil really doesn't have much to offer. And, and he, he takes what he offers and he weighs it before us like it's gold, like it's really valuable. And I'm telling you, for years and years and years, I stayed away from the kingdom of God because I, I didn't think I could live it. And I was afraid if I did live it, then, you know, life would just be over. You know, my life would be dull. My life would have no more fun. My life would have no more pleasure of any kind. And, of course, once we get saved, we realize that's a lie of the devil. And he's very good at uh, uh, giving us that lie. He's very good at laying that out there for us. I mean, he can, he, can, uh, he can diagram you a picture showing you all the reasons why you should, shouldn't serve God. But the reality of it is we come to a place, when we do get saved, we've come to that place where that cultivation process, that, that work, that preparation of the heart has been worked on by the power of the Holy Spirit. Praise God for the Holy Spirit. Praise God that when Jesus went to be with the Father, he didn't leave us alone. He did not leave us. He did not leave. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He sent another of the same kind to come to be with us. And it's that same spirit that is within us once we get saved that deals with us and draws us in to the kingdom of God. And there's a preparation that's going on. John the Baptist came to prepare the way for Jesus. He came, one, a voice crying in the wilderness. You know, he didn't belong to a denomination. He didn't belong to some big organization. He was a single, solitary man. He didn't even go to the city to do his preaching. You ever think about that? He didn't hold crusades. He didn't have revivals as we know revivals. Put it in the paper, let everybody know about it. Hope people, you know, we had people come from 450, 500 miles away. People from Livingston, Texas. People from uh, 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 Sulphur Springs, Longview, Little Rock. You know, and there may have been some come further than that. I don't know. Those are just the ones that I know about. We, we were blessed to have those people come all that way. But here John the Baptist is. He's on foot. There are, there's no such thing as that kind of communication. No such thing as even a billboard in those days. But yet he goes out into the wilderness and the power of the Holy Spirit brought the people to him. Now, the correlation I want you to see is here that although these people came from all these great distances because of the methods that were used to bring them here, it was the same Holy Spirit dealing and preparing their hearts 
that brought them to the place where they came and received that word that was put out. The same Holy Spirit that, that, that can do something, that, you know, when they have, you know, we had 180 people and I was, felt so blessed. Some of these crusades literally have thousands. And the people come. It's the same Holy Spirit that draws those folks. It's the same Holy Spirit that drew these people to come hear what John the Baptist had to say. The Holy Spirit is not encumbered by the fact that there's no computers in those days. It's not encumbered by the fact that there's, there's no uh, 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 mechanism to travel outside of a horse or maybe a carriage of, of some sort. There's no mechanism for, for, for communications as we have today. The Holy Spirit is not encumbered by these things. Amen. And so if he, can, if he can spread the gospel and prepare the people that, think what he can do in today's time. Amen. And so when we have revival, we need to understand that there's been a preparation going on in our hearts God's been dealing with us or God's been preparing us and that is a continuous process. When a person comes to salvation, that preparation begins wherever it begins. Probably doesn't begin in the church house. Sometimes it does. Sometimes they'll come because mama wanted them to come or, or the spouse wanted them to come. And they'll come and, and, and the Spirit of God begin to deal with them and they'll come to the point where they get saved. I like, I like to see that. That's what church likes to see. But oftentimes the preparation starts long before the gospel is ever expounded on. Again, the Holy Spirit knows what we don't know. And the first thing that takes place in this preparation part is there's a convincing of repentance. There comes a realization in this person's life, something's just not right. I mean, when I got saved, God had dealt with me for years and years and years. But most especially the last year before I got saved, God had really been doing a number on me. And he had dealt with me, and I was so rebellious, so, so stubborn, so hard-headed, I guess would be the proper terminology, that I just continued to resist. But that preparation process was going on in my heart. And I knew, well, I really knew all along, but I really knew that last year my life was out of control. I had just, Kenneth and I hadn't been married but a few years. I had a very happy marriage. We were, we were happy together. But God would not allow that one peace that was not there. He would not allow me to have peace about that. And I knew that I needed to repent of my ways. I knew that I needed to, to, to find the Lord and begin to serve him as I said I would for so many years. All those 30-something years I'd ran from the call of God, God had dealt with me, but never like he did that last year. And there was a preparation going on in my heart. There was a preparation that was preparing my heart to get to a point where I would repent. All that was lacking was convincing me to take that step. I knew I needed to do it. I mean, that, that was, within myself, there was no argument. Now, I might have sat and argued with somebody else, you know, I don't need that, you know. I was still trying to make my brand of religion fit. I didn't even know what it was. I just had my own, well, you know, I don't, I don't have to have that, you know. You know, you've been there. You had your own. You had your own little meanie religion with nobody in your denomination but you you know and you as the preacher of the choir in the pew setter it just so happened your whole life just fit your your doctrine perfectly you never stepped outside the boundaries of what was right you were always right on you anybody can anybody identify where i'm going here that was my that was my belief system wasn't written anywhere you know, I would, even, I would even mention things in the Bible that if they fit, you know, if I could use them. But I knew all along that I wasn't right with God. And I knew that there had to be some repentance. I had to, I had to come to a place 
unfortunately for me, I had to bottom out. I had to get to the point where I was so sick that I'd have got better to die. That's how sick I was. And I had to come to that place where I finally began to, didn't have physical or, 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 or even spiritual visions, but I had visions of where I was headed. And so the convincing of me bringing me to repentance was not near as hard at that point as it had been for the prior 30 years. Because for especially that last year, there had been a preparation. The Holy Spirit, I, I'm lost, I'm in the world. I'm not, you know, your, your worst person that ever walked the face of the earth, but you know and I know that's not, you know, sin is sin. Lost is lost. Unsaved is unsaved. And I was in that state, and I had to be convinced that I needed to I had to come to a place where I had to deal with this denomination of mine and see it for the hogwash that it was. Because whatever it is that keeps you in the world, it's hogwash. And so I had to come to that place where the Holy Spirit convinced me, boy, you've got to repent. And I remember laying on that couch at 203 East 33rd Street, or 201, whatever it was. And I remember laying on that couch, sick, and the realization coming to me is if you do not repent, if you do not get saved, this disease you have is capable of killing you and if you die, you're going to go to hell. Now that's not a that's not a uh, an elaborate uh, orientation of of anything other than that's just the plain old gospel truth coming to me. And suddenly, after some thirty years of dealing and preparing my heart, most especially that last year, that heart was ready. To come to a place where I was ready to repent. I was convinced that I had to repent. And when you come to that place, when you come to that place of repentance, all the excuses, all the junk, all the things that have stood in your way suddenly are just like a bowl of mush. There's no foundation there. There's no, there's no substance to the things that's kept you in the world all these years. And so the Holy Spirit had prepared me as he prepared many of these people who got saved this week or this month. We have, we've had, uh, counting eight there, we've had ten people saved in a month here. And we're only, we're only halfway through the month. So there's been some preparation going on because when repentance comes, the first thing you begin to do is you, 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 you've already considered your ways and you considered that that they weren't right. That's, that's what repentance brings you to. Repentance brings you uh, to admit a second thought, like, okay, you know, I had a thought that I was okay, but now my thought is, no, I ain't in such good shape. That there has to be a correcting of that that is wrong. You have to correct the errors that are in your life. You have to come to that place by the same power that John the Baptist preached with. That same power. He came into all the country about Jordan preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Make, make whose path straight? The, the sinner? No, I'm talking about making the path straight for Christ. He was preparing the way for Christ's coming. Yes. That has not changed. Amen. Christ has, has came and he's lived as a man and he died on the cross and rose again three days later, but we're still preaching a gospel. It's not, not necessarily the exact same gospel that, uh, that uh, 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 John the Baptist was preaching, but then again it is too. We just add 
we, we have what Christ did to add to that. Obviously, the cross is a very important part of that now. But this, the same result ends up that when a person has been prepared to receive truth, then the first thing that takes place is repentance. It's repentance by putting your faith in what Christ did on the cross. And the first thing that takes place is that Holy Spirit, that same thing that has been preparing your heart, that, excuse me, not the same thing, same person that has been preparing your heart for all this period of time, now is in your heart and is helping you to correct that that is wrong. It's not, a, it's not an afterthought, but it is a second thought. It, it, it's a considering of your ways. It's, a, it's a, 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 a leading and a guidance to change your ways, to change your mind. Because what you have, what you've always thought, what you've always done, what you've always been is not where that preparation takes you. It's time to begin to set things right. So repentance is a, is a preparation to process the heart. And in the process of that, it produces lifestyle change, a new way of thinking, a new way of acting, a new way of talking, a new way of doing. That's what takes place. Now, here we are. We've had revival which revival is a form of this because it's prepared your heart to receive the revival. And as it does with salvation, so shall it do with those who are already saved. If, if salvation brings about a change of thinking, then revival brings about a continuous, excuse me, a continuous change of who we are. The greatest deterrent to revival is self. We get to a place where we feel like we've arrived. We get to a place where we think highly of ourselves. Well, look at me. Look at what I do for the Lord. Well, I'm a preacher of the gospel. I serve the Lord as a minister. I preach to the people. I do good deeds every day. But there has to be a, a dealing with self and a dying to self going on in that person in order to be corrected by that same thing that corrects you at, at, at salvation. The same sanctification process that takes place at salvation continues in believers as we serve God. And we're our own worst enemies oftentimes because we get comfortable with where we're at with the Lord. Doesn't mean that we're bad people and we're going to die and go to hell, but, but on the contrary, God wants that process to continue, that preparation that has prepared that heart. He's continually preparing the heart for change. As someone expounds on the Word, or as you read the Word, or as you live your daily life, that power of the Holy Spirit working in you is preparing your heart to receive that circumstance, to receive what God is doing and allowing change to take place in us. We're not changing because we're, if we don't change, we're going to die and go to hell as we would have had we not got saved. But we're changing because that's the process, that's that's what God does in us when we get saved. So the revival, now that revival has happened, what do we do? We keep having revival. Yeah. Said down there at the bottom, said, People ask, What shall we do? He answered and said unto them, He that hath two coats, let him impart to him that hath none. And then the publicans asked, What shall we do? And he said unto them, Exact no more than that which is appointed you. And the soldiers asked, what shall we do? And he said, do no violence. What, what does that mean? He's saying, do that that God does in your heart and do it on a daily basis. 
Don't just do it for show. Don't just do it because it makes us look good. Do it because it's the natural result of the Holy Spirit working in us and allows us to, to, to receive and accomplish what God's put in our hearts to do. That's what ministering is all about. The first sermon I ever preached in a Little Rock church over here was we're all called to the ministry. I'll never forget that. It was a pretty simple message. But it was all about the fact that every person who's a, who's a believer is a minister. Now, you may not stand in a pulpit. You may not even preach from the Word per se. But as a believer, it's your duty to minister where God places you. I forget who said it. Uh, there, there's people who sit in, in, in pews for 50 years and are never changed by the Word of God. Why are they not? Why, are they, why does that Word not change it? Because they've never gone back to the initial point of repentance. They've never really repented. They see themselves, or even if they did repent, they refuse to repent after the initial act of salvation. Someone might question their salvation after been, say, 50 years and never changed. That'll be up to God to decide, but I think I know how he'll decide on that. Because you're not just saved to just sit on a pew and get a free ride to heaven. That's a, certainly a fringe benefit of being saved. But if you refuse to change after that, and there's too many Christians who, if, if, if they were answering a survey, they probably wouldn't even recognize themselves, but too often we don't allow the Holy Spirit to do what he wants to do in us. We want to hang on to self in some way. We want to hang on to what we want. We want to serve God, we want to go to heaven, we want to be a good Christian, but... You know, is it really necessary that I do this? Is it really necessary that I go to church? Is it really necessary that I pray? Is it really necessary for me to read the Word? You know, and we find all these excuses for not doing what we challenge as being necessary. That's not true repentance. A repentant heart is open to the guidance and the leading of the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist says, set the path straight. What he was talking about and the phrase he was using there was a common phrase for that time. you got to understand, they didn't have Interstate 30 and Highway 67 out here. They didn't even have water off street. Roads were few and far between. And oftentimes when they travel from one place to the other, they'd go across just open ground and when a king or somebody that had some substance came along he had people that went before him you know I don't know if you read in the paper about Biden being over here in decab and how much money come out of the taxpayers pocket you know that's what they're doing they're setting a path for it they're preparing a way and I've been in, involved in a lot of those and you can't imagine the security that goes on when the president of the United States comes to the city we start weeks before he ever gets here, he's here 30 minutes. But there's weeks of preparation for every 30-minute stop that he makes. That's a preparation for what's coming. And in the old days, they would prepare the way. They would literally clear a road, if you will, for whatever transportation this nobleman had, he would be able to travel in comfort. He wouldn't have to worry about it. Now, it wasn't a paved highway or anything, but they would prepare the way. That's the phrase John the Baptist is using here. That's what he's talking about, making the path straight. He's talking about preparing the people to receive what Christ was all about. The same thing goes on in the expounding on the gospel today, except the process takes place in the hearts. You see, John the Baptist... The word voice there is, is taken from the Greek word, I think they pronounce it phony. 
is, is spelt phone, P-H-O-N-E. It's where you get the word phone from. So voice, phone, is the Greek. The word crying out in the wilderness means, I'm sorry, excuse me, the phone also means noise or sound. So the voice meant either phone, sound, or noise. Crying aloud in wilderness meant startling or awakening. And you know, we all know that John the Baptist was, was known for not mentioning any words. He pretty well told it like it was. And so when Christ came, Christ represents what? The Word. So John the Baptist there was to wake them up. He woke them up, and then Christ was to come to bring the word. And so when we deliver the gospel of Jesus Christ, the same process is going on. It may not be done by two different people, but the sound of that that is done, the noise, if you will, the awakening of the people is what the Holy Spirit does in your heart. He first awakens you to that that is going to be preached, that is going to be taught. Because if you're not receptive to it, if you're out there texting, you haven't been startled enough. If you're out there jibber-jabbering with your neighbor sitting there, your, prayer, your heart has not been properly prepared. That's why we do praise and worship prior to the preaching of the Word. It's not about a schedule. It's not about, you know, some churches have programs. And I mean, buddy, you can, you can look at that program. It's going to be to the minute. But the whole idea behind having a praise and worship is to awaken you to the moving of the Spirit of God so that when the Word comes, your heart has been prepared to receive that Word. Okay? You, you, you're, to, you're to worship God. That's the purpose of, of the praise and worship portion of, of the service. But as you, what, what does the Bible say about praising God? He inhabits the praises of his people. So what you're doing, you're, you, you're awakening yourself to what the Spirit of God wants to do in you. Now that doesn't mean that I can't walk up to you or somebody walk up to you on the street corner and expound on the Word to you. But that's why church services are set up as they are that people will be receptive to what is being said. Now that doesn't mean everybody is receptive. I mean you can tune a person out anytime you want to. And unfortunately people do that. I remember when we were at the other little church before we went to Little Rock Church. I remember some young boys they sat on the back pew every week. And they were very disrespectful. And they would sit back there and giggle and poke at one another. And they were totally unfocused on what was going on in the service. And it really it hurt me not because they weren't paying attention to me. It hurt me because they were in the house of God and had no more respect for God's word and for God, who God is, even if they didn't want him, that's fine. At least show some respect to the whole concept of what church is about. And you don't want to tell mom and dad, well, you just need to leave them at home because you want to reach them. You're hoping that somewhere, somewhere in that, the Spirit of God can, can penetrate their hard heart and prepare them for the reception of the word. One of those young men uh, actually left the church, went back to his mother's, and was killed weeks after he went back to his mom's. And he said in I don't know how many sermons preached about salvation and accepting Christ. The Holy Spirit was there trying to reach him, but he just tuned it out. I mean, I don't know. Maybe he had a moment before he went on to glory or went on to eternity to open it to glory. I pray he did. 
But you can, you can, that that you can receive, you can refuse. And so that's why it's so important for people to, who come to church to be receptive to what that church service is all about. It, it doesn't matter if, if you, you know, you can even go somewhere where, where maybe you don't care that much for the preacher's preaching. That doesn't mean the Spirit of God can't deal with your heart, can't deal with your circumstance. You know, I've said it many times that we pray and ask God for things, and then we don't come to church. And how do you know whether or not God didn't answer your prayer the day you didn't show up? Well, we do the same thing sometimes when we come. The Spirit of God is administering to us, but we're not receptive to it because we're tired or or, you know, it may even be, it may be something as innocent as being tired, you know. I mean, that's not something you do on purpose. I mean, nobody works a 12-hour day with the idea, well, I'm just going to work 12 hours a day and get so tired I can't hardly stay awake. And that may not be your fault, but when we come in the house of God, we have to come in with a praise on our lips. We have to come in ready to praise God, to worship Him, and allow the Spirit of God to prepare our hearts to receive what's being expounded on and it, it, it may you know same it's just like the testimonies you know i started that as a as a temporary thing we're just going to try that a couple of weeks and it never has really been what i thought it was going to be but you know through the years just kind of become what it is and and i know people have been ministered to by the testimony people have come and tell me, you know, so-and-so said such-and-such, you know, and that really, you know, that really meant a lot to me. That's a preparation of the heart receiving something that God wants to do. I mean, God can use, God can use a politician. Whew, that almost sounds blasphemous to say. He can use a politician to minister you if he so chooses to do so. And so, the whole idea is to be receptive to what God wants to do. So you might ask the question, well, as a believer, I'm already saved. Why do I need to repent? Well, John the Baptist said it, because the kingdom of God is at hand. You know, there's no doubt in my mind that, that when we get to heaven, we're going to all wish and, and think, well, I wish I had done a little more, you know. I, mean, I don't think we're going to be sad about it because I don't think I'll be a sad person. But the Bible does say that he's going to wipe away all of our tears. What are we going to be crying about? At least before it begins, I think there's going to be, you know, obviously there's judgment coming, even for those that are saved. Not judgment of, of hellfire, but certainly judgments of admission and omission. Judgment on what we've done with this... Uh, uh, this life. So John the Baptist said, repent because the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, John the Baptist was a voice, but it was Christ who was speaking through him. Amen? It was Christ that was speaking to him. It's all about who he is and what he has to say to us. Every preacher you've ever heard, you may uh, uh, say, well, that was a, a good sermon. That, was, that really meant a lot to me. That's the Spirit of God ministering to you. I, 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 that was pointed out to me. My, my old pastor, my former pastor, I'm always using the word old. Former pastor was, was a really good preacher. I mean, he could really preach. And I can't remember how many times that I would get through the service and think, man, he wasn't preaching to anybody but me. Yeah. I've been reading my mail or something. And I would, I would be out there and I'd just be thinking, you know, thank you, Lord, for that word today. You know, boy, I needed that. Or, you know, thank you for that spanking today, Lord, whatever the case might have been. And I'd run into somebody out in the foyer. We'd be talking about how great the sermon was. And they'd say, yeah, he wasn't preaching to nobody but me. <laughs> now, I love him very much, and he was a very brilliant man, but he didn't have the intelligence to know exactly what to say to everybody. Only the Holy Spirit. That just, 
You know, I know that's a simple premise, and I know you've heard me say that before, but you just stop and think about that. Now. Take an old country boy like me, and there can be 80 people in here, and I can preach something with, with my own slant on it, my own thoughts on it, and the Holy Spirit, if he so decides, can take that and divide it 80 different ways and make, make the point hit home with every person in the building. Now that a preparation has to take place for that to happen. You can't be back there texting. You can't be back there joking with your buddy and receive the preparation that is necessary for that kind of Holy Spirit work to go on. Boy, that's, that's powerful. Holy Spirit is... Where would, we, where would we be without him? Amen. So John the Baptist would do the speaking, but Christ, being the word, go, go to 1 Thessalonians 2.13. You see, the word is distinctive. It's instructive. It, it, it is literally articulate in all that it does. See, John the Baptist would arouse people, but Christ taught them. The, 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 the minister gets your attention with his voice. But Christ is the teacher. The, you, well, you heard Lauren say that many, many times. May the teacher come. Oh, he's like that. The teacher is the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, as ministers, we get, we get the gravy and we, we get the pats on the back. But it's really the Holy Spirit that's doing that that is needed to be done. It's the Holy Spirit that, number one, prepared that heart. It's the Holy Spirit that brought that heart. Now the Holy Spirit set up that heart to receive in that heart. All done by the Holy Spirit. Preacher hadn't got anything to do with it. It's all about the Holy Spirit doing what he does. Second Thess uh, uh, 1 Thessalonians 2.13. For this cause also... Thank we God without ceasing, because ye, when you ye received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Now notice, that, notice the last few words there, that believe. Unless a heart has been prepared, the belief's not there. A person doesn't repent till they believe. Because if you don't believe, there's nothing to repent of. Now you might not have a full theological understanding of your circumstance, but there has to come a preparation of that heart. There has to come a dealing with that heart that something is awry there. Something's not what it should be. So in the preparation of that heart and in the dealing of that heart, and now here God is, he's brought you into an atmosphere where you can receive what he wants to do. It's effectual. In other words, it works that that needs to be worked in you. Say you have anger in you. You're a believer. You, you love the Lord. You're going to heaven someday. But something's going on and you have some anger in you. And here comes Goofy the preacher. Do, 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 do. And he comes up. Oh, oh, yo, oh, yo. I'm going to preach a sermon. He ain't got a clue what's going on with you. He don't know you from Adam. He never laid eyes on you before. And he gets up in his clumsy attempt to deliver the word and does about a halfway ho hum job of it. 
but you're a believer. The Holy Spirit begins to deal with you about your anger. And even in his fumbling attempt, in his, his poor attempt at expounding on the word, the Spirit of God is working in your heart. He's already prepared. He's already dealt with you about your anger. You just not want to hear it right now. And, and, and so you're, you're in rejection mode, but you're a believer. Now, there's only two things that can happen here is you can either just be rebellious and you can, you can just put your hand up and go, I'm not going to receive that, Lord. You know, we don't say it that way, but we do that sometimes. We refuse what God wants to do in us. It's a very uncomfortable place to be. I've had people, and I tell them, I don't think that's what the Lord wants here. You know, they come to me and I talk to them and I thought, you know, maybe you should consider this. But they just not, that's not what they want to hear right now. But they're a believer. And as long as they're a believer, the Spirit of God is dwelling there and he's going to deal with them. And as he deals with them, no matter if they refuse what he wants to do, it's just going to make them miserable. If you're a miserable Christian, it's because God is dealing with you about something and you are not receiving it. Now, you need to receive that. Now, that doesn't mean that you're not, you know, I'm not talking about tests and trials. I'm talking about what God is dealing with you about and you're not receiving it. It'll make you miserable. You know, we get miserable sometimes in our tests and trials, but that's part of God, what God is doing in it. We make matters worse if we refuse. That's why I always say I, that does connect. If you receive your, your test and trial for what it is, then you can see God working in it, and you're not misery anymore. You're not in misery anymore. Does that make sense? But if you reject it, then you're going to be one more miserable Christian. And the Holy Spirit loves you. God loves you enough to continue to deal with you about it. And if you finally get to that place where you yield to that, you, you're, you're right back. In essence, you're right where that non-believer is when he gets saved. You come to a place of repentance. Now, repentance means to, to change your ways or change your thinking. And so that effectual working of the Holy Spirit in you will continue to deal with you until you deal with the situation yourself and you receive what he wants to do. And it, it says, again, I read it again, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that belief. And so the Holy Spirit will work in that believer if he wants to fight it. He'll not zap you and take you out, thank goodness. But he will continue to deal with you until he is effective in what it is that he's trying to do. In other words, he won't, he won't give up on you. Just like when I got called to preach, and I've always said I was 14. I, you know, I really don't remember this, the date that I was called. I was about 14 years old, somewhere in that general area. I might have been younger than that. But God dealt with me, but I resisted that. And I, I, I kind of struggled with it for several years, and finally I just put it up on the shelf somewhere. But the Spirit of God never left me in the sense that he never quit dealing with me. And I was lost as a goose. If I died, I'd have gone to hell. There's no doubt in my mind about that. But the Bible says that the call is without repentance. And it's not just talking about calling preachers there, but that's, that is what it's talking about too. And so that call was on my life. And I ran from it. 
But the moment I got to the point where I believed, the moment I got where I yielded to my belief, now I have the Holy Spirit in me. And he is much more effective working with us than he is when we're working against him. Not that he can't do it. I mean, he could make us do whatever we want to do. I've always said God could make us do the funky chicken if that's what he wanted us to do. But that's not how he that's not how he works. That's not how he shows his love to us. And so when we begin to believe, then the effectiveness of the Holy Spirit begins to develop in us. Finally brought me to the place of repentance. And then once I got saved, then the process continues in me. Revival is continually going on in all of us. Know that. You know, we know, I think I've, uh, I've convinced you that revival begins in here. It's there all the time. It's whether or not you yield to it or not. I mean, you can go to sleep at the wheel. But the Spirit of God is in you. He's wanting to do all that revival is in you. He wants to do that all the time. It's us that gets in the way. It's us that slows down. It's us that gets tired. It's us that gets complacent. It's us that gets apathetic. And so we have to allow revival to continue in us by yielding to the effectual working of the Holy Spirit that is within us however we receive it. He's talking about here about receiving the word from some man, but it's the Holy Spirit that does the work. And so if it's the Holy Spirit that does the work, then we're not dependent upon anybody else to have revival. That light bulb, you've seen them in old cartoons, that light bulb. Hey, I did it. That's where revival's at. Holy Spirit's not coaxed into doing something. See, that's what I grew up thinking revival was. That we come together in a meeting and we coax the Holy Spirit into making us do things. That's not revival. That's not revival. That's a good time, maybe. Maybe it's an enjoyable time, but that's not revival. Revival is what we saw here this week and what we've been seeing this fall, th that that has taken place in the lives of the people in this church. Amen. When a person suddenly, their life changes. Hey, I think differently than I used to think. And I'm talking about, I've had people tell me in this church that, that have been in other churches for a while and they've come here and the Lord has woke them up but it wasn't me that woke them up I might have I might have made the noise I might have made the sound the phone the phone eh? I probably ain't pronouncing that right and that's probably some Greek scholar just dying laughing at me <laughs> old country hick don't even know how to pronounce it remember my name's goofy so it's not my voice that woke them up the word was expounded on by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what, that's what set these people's, what set this change in their life. It wasn't that they weren't good Christians before. It's just that they had not received what God wanted them to receive. Now, whether or not that was whatever reason. And so... The preparation is the work of the Holy Spirit, and that preparation continues throughout our relationship with God. Because that's going to, this repentance, this, this preparation, this revival going in you, going on in you, is going to do what? It's going to create two things in you, and I'm going to close with this. Because if I, if I go too far into this, then I'll get in more than we can do tonight. So if y'all, if musicians want to come, if, if the preparation has been there and our hearts have been prepared and we've received 
the working and, and the direction of the Holy Spirit. That's going to create two things within us and really create more than that, but two I want to, I want to talk about right now. First of all, it leads to obedience. The second thing is that it makes us trainable. Every believer must be trainable. Because if we're not trainable, then we've arrived and it's all about us and what we know. You see, a lot of ministers fall into that, to that uh, 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 category. If they don't watch themselves, they get to thinking so highly of themselves and think, well, I'm a, you know, I'm a good preacher and I, I, know, I know the Word, you know, and I've had people tell me, I know the Word of God. Yeah, well, I didn't say you didn't. Yeah. Chill out, dude. You know, I mean, they'll get, they'll get mad at you. But we have to stay trainable all the time. Because once this revival begins, that's going to lead to obedience. And obedience is never going to disallow you to be trained. Being obedient is going to open you up to teaching whether it's by reading the Word of God, whether it's by reading commentaries, whether it's about watching uh, a, a, a TV minister or a radio minister, or whether it's by uh, uh, fellowship with other believers, whatever mode or means that God chooses to teach you, that's up to Him. I probably have, and I'm not, I'm not don't, don't misinterpret this as a boast, because I'm certainly not boasting, but but I've probably done more studying in the last couple of months than I've done since I've been saved. And the more I study, the more I realize I don't know. You know. I don't have all the answers. But I'm open to what God is showing me. Because when you get trainable, when you get to that point where you will receive training from the Holy Spirit, guess what? He'll provide it. He'll supply it. You might think, well, why did I ever see this before? Might not have been as receptive to it before. And that comes with obedience and being obedient to the guidance and the leading of the Holy Spirit. I mean, the Holy Spirit's not going to guide you to a beer joint. He's not going to guide you to something that is not of God. But he will guide you to the things of God. And you can be trained in those things. You can receive from those things. And God will begin to open up in your heart and life what needed. It will expose your heart to you. What's going on in your heart. Actually, I guess that would be three things because that's, that's correctiveness. Make you obedient, make you trainable, make you correctable. Those three things. Just give me that. And so that's what revival does in us. Brings obedience, training, and correctiveness. Amen? And I'm going to close with that. It's kind of hard to just cut that off right there because I could, I could go somewhere with that, but I, but I won't do that tonight. Revival. Now what? We continue revival. Continue it in here. Continue allowing God to do what he wants to do in our heart and life. Amen? Praise God. Hallelujah. I'm excited about this last weekend. I'm excited about these last couple of months. I'm excited about what lays ahead for us. If we as a church will yield to the Spirit of God. See, most churches, there's always a remnant that'll do that. But a very effective church is going to be a church that each individual will allow God to do what he wants to do in their life. That means correction sometimes. That means being trainable. That means being obedient to his word. It may not even be comfortable sometimes. But if we'll do that, if we'll do that, 
then he can accomplish something through you. And if he's accomplishing something through you and this one and this one and this one and that one and that one and this one and that one and this one, then the church is going to really start accomplishing things for the kingdom of God. Amen? Praise God. Hallelujah. Bow your heads, please. Heavenly Father, I thank you tonight. I thank you for your word, Lord God. Hallelujah. Glory to your name, Lord. I thank you for every person here tonight, Lord God. And I just want to pray a prayer tonight. I want to open up this altar to you. If you need to come to the altar for anything, if you need prayer for anything, I'd be glad to pray with you. You just need to come talk to the Lord. The altar is open at this time. But I want to pray right now for this church. Not only my Wednesday night faithful, but I want to pray for everybody that calls this church home. That we will allow the Spirit of God to continue to prepare our hearts, continue to prepare the way, to make the path straight, that our focus would be on those things that God wants to do in our heart and life. Heavenly Father, we come tonight. I thank you for every person that's here. I thank you, Lord God, that I feel a receptiveness tonight to your spirit, Lord. That maybe there are some here tonight that maybe there are things that you're dealing with us about that maybe we've been resistant in. Maybe we have not been as open and obedient as we should be in those things. And I pray you open up the eyes of our understanding that we would see, that we would feel and know what your spirit would have in this circumstance. Whatever it might be, Lord God, let us be obedient. Let us be trainable. Let us be correctable at all things, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. 